Yeah, well, welcome to the recap. Yeah, no, and this is actually very uh, beneficial because I get to live stream it again, except this time I have my microphone charged. So the sound won't cut out 20 minutes in and then I'll have it for YouTube for as long as YouTube continues to host my videos. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and turn that light off in the back. That'll help with some of the contrast here. Yeah, we could all just take a nap. It'd be great and it'd be in, very anti-inflammatory as well. So yeah, um, for those of you that are new to these workshops, um, what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to be breaking down inflammation, uh, the causes of inflammation, uh, breaking down whether it's good for us, whether it's bad for us, whether it's as the American Medical Association, a lot of medical doctors have gotten on the bandwagon, started saying that it is the cause for all major chronic diseases, or if it's just a cause, or if it's not really part of the problem at all. We'll be breaking that down tonight. Um, those of you in this room kind of know who we are and what we're about. But for those of you online, um, we are a part of a organization called Max Living. And Max Living has 350 offices across the United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, where our mission is to actually flip healthcare on its head, actually start addressing health from a causal perspective, as opposed to just focusing on the sickness and the symptoms and getting people truly healthy and well and able to experience and live to their full potential. And so we're going to be doing that tonight with inflammation. So let's start with the diagnosis. And so what I covered in my last class is I said that any time that you walk out of a medical doctor's office with a diagnosis that ends in the suffix itis, they've diagnosed you with inflammation. And that can be rhinitis, meaning nose, cystitis, meaning colon. It could be you know, almost anything but itis meaning inflammation. So just attach the prefix to the suffix and now you've got an inflammation. And so a lot of the stuff that we end up being treated for is actually just inflammation by its definition. But that's just a little Latin for you. Inflammation at its core, what it actually is, is actually just blood flow to a specific area. And now that can be for a number of reasons. And so we talk about inflammation from a, you know, an, an area that most of us understand. If we walk out of here, we step off the curb, we land on the side of our foot, we twist our ankle, we're gonna get inflammation to that area really fast. Now, what is that inflammation doing? Well, what it's doing first is it's bringing blood to the ankle. Why would it bring blood to that ankle? Is that good or bad? It's very good. It's because that's how healing happens. It's bringing red blood cells, you know, just in case that, you know, you're starting to lose blood from that area. So that area doesn't get there. And if it is losing blood, that helps to clean the wound and get any, any of the germs or bacteria or microbes out. If it is a closed damage to it, it creates a bruise, of course, because there's still some bleeding internally. But then what that blood also does is it brings nutrients there for healing. If your body, for some reason, needs more, um, let's say collagen to help repair damaged ligaments in that ankle. It'll bring the collagen in the blood. If it needs more vitamin C to get that collagen in there, it'll bring that vitamin C there. If there's any infection or anything, your white blood cells are being transported with that blood as well. And so now your immune system is woken up to that. Also, what else do you get with that inflammation? Pain, right? Pain is a huge component of inflammation, especially when you step off a curb and you twist your ankle. What's that pain there for? Is that pain bad or is that pain good? It's good. It's good. Right? Yeah, the damage is already done. Right? You stepped off the curb. That's the bad part. The good part is that your body is so intelligent that in the moment it responds and says, hey, we have damaged tissues here. And we need to start paying attention to those damaged tissues and not doing anything that would hurt it worse. So you get up off of the ground, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and you take a step. And it's like, ooh. That's telling you that you shouldn't do that because you're gonna create further damage. And so we have to recognize that inflammation at sort of especially acute inflammation is really just there to begin the healing process. It kickstarts the healing process. And so inflammation at its root is not a bad thing. But what do we do? What are the main focuses for inflammation when it's diagnosed? Let's say for the ankle. What is it, was a medical doctor, was a nurse, 
what does a physical therapist tell you to do with a twisted ankle? There you go. And really, yeah, and elevate. Yeah, so you're, you're hitting multiple of the acronym. You guys have heard the term RICE or the acronym RICE or RICE is. So rest, ice, compression, elevation, support has been added. I've heard it renamed as princes where the, uh, you get the end there for uh, non-steroidal non anti-inflammatories. And basically what you can do that with that acronym is you can throw it out. The only part of that acronym that is actually good for an acute injury is rest. That's because your body's already doing exactly what it needs. So let's break down what rice actually does for us. So rice we've established is good. It allows our body to do what it needs to do. But what don't we have any time for in this country? Rest. So we go to the other stuff. So ice, what does ice do? Well, it, it makes everything colder, which vasoconstricts, meaning narrows the blood vessels, which means not as much blood's getting there, not as much white blood cells are getting there, not as much nutrients getting there, not as much oxygen is getting there, so what's it do to the healing process? It slows it down. Great, number one, so we gotta throw away ice. Compression, what's that do? Same, prevents blood flow. Again, so it's gonna inhibit the same healing process from happening. So elevation, what's that do? Slows down blood flow. So now we're not getting that blood flowing in, blood flowing out the way that it should. And support, that is good, but you don't want to support in a way that's going to constrict blood flow. And really, you should only support tissues that are damaged that can't support themselves. Really, you want to promote as much movement in that area as possible so that it doesn't seize up and then you need therapy to help recover from the injury. So really, the main thing that you need, rest. You need to make sure there's not interference there. You need to make sure you're getting the nutrients you need, and there are anti-inflammatory nutrients as well. So we'll be getting into that. So the main three components here, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which a recent uh, research article came out and said that for every dollar that we spend on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that we actually spend 33 cents on the effects of that drug. So the side effects, the negative side effects, actually create issues that we then have to spend 33 cents for every dollar that we actually spend on the NSAID. Then rice, we just broke that one down. Not good to do that. Focus on the R, ignore the rest of that. And then surgery. What would surgery be for? Well, that's if the tissue is so damaged that it does need an intervention to heal. And there, there is a time and a place for surgery. And I'll even say that there's a time and a place for non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. My wife had a, um, uh, I forget exactly what kind of infection it was, uh, but she was in so much pain from it. It was in her, it was in her n mouth, nose, and sinuses that she needed to take something to relieve the pain. And so she did. Now, she asked me if I wanted some because I was dealing with similar symptoms and not feeling well. I actually took a day off of work. Never happens. And uh, I said, no, I will not take a medication. Don't try to give me a medication unless it's an emergency, an absolute emergency because more often than not, these do more harm than good. And you look at the side effects of most non steroidal anti-inflammatories, 15,000 people died last year from, from non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use. Now, some of that is people that were allergic, and some of that was taking too much, overdosing on it, kids getting into it, it makes that really easy to do. But they're over the counter. They're really easy to abuse that way. And so we, we have to really be careful with that. Now, some of that just comes down to the ways that it affects the kidneys and the liver as they filter out and try to get that out of our bloodstream. And so those aren't necessarily good. And so if we want to avoid surgery and we don't want to take NSAIDs and really we have to ignore, right, so what do we do? What should we be doing? Well, we have to start with what actually is inflammation, right? We, we broke that down. It's, it's the healing process. And we don't want to limit the healing process and we want to honor the pain that comes along with that healing process and that it's actually gonna guide us. So, you know, a sprained ankle, of course. But what about chronic inflammation? Is chronic inflammation good? No. It's still the healing process in action, but it's the healing process at its beginning not actually able to complete because the injury is happening over and over. If I go out and I continue to sprain my ankle over and over and over again, day after day, and I never stop stepping off that curb wrong, that inflammation is actually going to do more damage there just because of the stress hormones that are involved with creating that new injury. And so we want to make sure that we're not creating chronic inflammation. Now, most of us don't step off of 
you know, curbs on our ankle the wrong way every single day, day after day. But what do a lot of us do? We create inflammation with our lifestyle. And so we see chronic pain, chronic fatigue, chronic insomnia, chronic weight gain, chronic anxiety and, and depression and chronic GI issues because of the stress and the way that that puts us into a sympathetic response day after day after day. So this is, this is actually interesting. Inflammation and COVID were actually huge news for the last three years. But this was, uh, what was the date on that one? So uh, 5-22-23, so this year, um, this is from a medical doctor who was following the Ministry of Health out of Israel. And regarding COVID, they saw that the total COVID deaths in the age group under 50 that had no com comorbidities was zero. But if you look at people with comorbidities that got COVID, they had tons of leftover inflammation if they survived getting the disease, or even if they just survived the stress of having the disease around them. And so it really came down to inflammation, pre-existing inflammation versus non-existing inflammation. So acute versus chronic inflammation. <laughs> Both are a good thing, but if it continues to happen over and over, you're not letting the healing process complete. And it really indicates chronic stressors. So chronic inflammation indicates chronic stressors. So we got to eliminate the stressors. And those come down to the five essentials. Every stressor can be broken down into one of these five categories. Number one is our inflammatory sad diet. If we're dealing with chronic inflammation, more often than not, it's coming from what we're putting in our mouths every single day. And when you look at the SAD diet, some of the main areas that are being impacted break down into uh, about five different categories. Number one is sugar, right? We have to curb our carbohydrates. We consume about 350 pounds of sugar every single year. And, you know, 100 years ago, that number was just five. So just the genetic changes that have had to happen to adapt to that. You think about you know, how microevolution happens. We have not been allowing our bodies to make those changes quickly. And as a process, chronic inflammation has gone up. So if you look at just about any processed food item, you go back to that nutrition label, you're going to see not one, not two, probably three, four, or five of these different ingredients on there because we add sugar to everything. And it's, it's, it's processed food. It's not fruits that are doing this to us. It's not even raw honey that's doing it to us. If, all you, if the only sugars that you added to your diet were the sugars that you physically added to the foods that you were making, you would not get to 350 pounds a year. 350 pounds is when you're drinking sugary beverages. 350 pounds are when you're eating out fast food or you know, pre-prepared, pre-packaged foods. And so, you know, 100 years ago, 125 years ago, this was not the case because these things, most of them weren't even available. And then you look at artificial sweeteners. How much more have we had to adapt to that? At least before the 1900s, sugar was a real thing still. It just took a lot more work to get it done because there were only certain parts of the world and people were a lot more isolated at that time. Now, not only do we have more access to sugar, we've created in a lab just in the last 50 years, these artificial sweeteners that our bodies never experienced. No, nobody in the, your family history has ever experienced. And what that does is it tells your brain that sugar is about to hit your bloodstream. So it releases a bunch of insulin, but it never does. And so that makes you even more inflamed than just getting too many sugars inside your body. So when you're talking about sugars, you should be getting between 25 and 35 grams of sugar a day. You don't need more than that. Your brain can work on that just fine. And even if it's not getting that, it will create its own sugar through a process called ketosis. You guys have heard of the ketogenic diet. Ketosis, your body creates its own ketones to replace sugar. And for the most part, most people do okay with that process. But 25 to 35 grams of sugar a day is sufficient for your body to do what it needs to do. That was the early 1900s that we were only consuming five pounds of sugar a year. Yeah. And now we're at 350. Wow. Yeah, it's a huge, huge change. So, yeah, before I get into anti-inflammatory foods, let's go through the next couple of categories. So the next category that creates inflammation is fats. And so we've vilified fats. Um, and specifically, you know, just all fats 
in general were vilified in the 1960s, 1970s, as we were fighting cardiovascular disease, we have not beat cardiovascular disease. The biggest breakthrough we made was to tell people to stop smoking. But now heart disease is back on the rise again. We beat the, we beat the smoking curve. Now most people don't smoke. If you do still smoke, stop smoking. Now, fats. We wrecked the relationship with fats. People don't realize every cell in your body is wrapped with fat and requires that fat. It's part of your brain. In fact, it's most of your brain. Half of your brain is saturated fat. It's over 60% of your brain is fat. And so if you get, eat a low fat diet, you're going to deprive your brain of the fats that it needs. However, the fats that it needs are not the fats that we're getting. Most of the fats that we get are highly processed, high in omega-6 fatty acids, where we need less processed, under-processed, but non-processed fats, fats that aren't heated, fats that aren't extracted from the foods that they're in. We need to eat fats that are, or foods that are rich in fat in order to get them into ourselves in a way that's easily digestible. Same thing with sugars. If we just ate the sugary foods that are naturally sugared, would be fine. You know, an apple is actually fairly high in sugar, but it comes with the fiber it needs. Same things with fats. When it comes in the food that is naturally high in fats, it has everything it needs for you to process that food and digest that food. When you extract the fat out, now is when it becomes inflammatory. And so things that aren't naturally high in fats, we need to avoid, especially when, it's, when the fat's been extracted from that. So something like canola, canola oil, Canadian oil low acid. There's no canola plant in the world. It's rapeseed. They extract the oil from this little seed through this chemical process that by the time it gets into that bottle this big, it's already denatured and highly inflammatory. You know, sunflower seed, safflower seed, grape seed, anything that you step on and you can't get oil out and it's seeds and you're not going to get much out of them in general. It doesn't mean that eating a sunflower seed is bad for you because right, everything that you need to process that fat is inside that seed. I wouldn't recommend eating a ton of grape seeds. They're pretty hard to break down, but eating a grape with seeds in it is going to be far better for you than trying to consume grape seed oil. Avocado is much better for you. Avocado oil, step down from avocados, but still better because you just have to squeeze an avocado and oil starts dripping out. You need an avocado and oil starts dripping down your chin and down your arm and into your hand. Same thing with olives. You start eating olives, you get a mouthful. Olive oil just starts running down your face. You know, but then we want to go and we want to heat those fats up. And that inflames them as well. That denatures the fats inside and that becomes very inflammatory inside of your system because your body needs those fats. And if all you're getting are inflamed fats, it'll use the inflamed fats and then you become more inflamed. Yes, ma'am. Sunflower seeds are good for you, but sunflower oil is not because it's been extracted from the plant and because it's a seed, it's harder to get out of. So most seeds and seed oils are not good. Seed butter is not so bad because really they've taken all the components of the seed and just broken it down and kept it all together. It's just coming in a different form. Now, if they extract all the fat out of it and they put something else in, they call it low fat peanut butter, or low fat almond butter. It's like, now we're not getting to where we need to be. And so you really want to get healthy oils, healthy oils. Next category is actually going to be your proteins. And proteins, I was talking on Saturday to a group. We were doing a cardiovascular class at Natural Grocers. And I said, when, when it comes to proteins, this is where you want to put your budget, right? If you're buying proteins. So easy way to invest your budget here is go vegetarian, go vegan. You can get all the proteins you need from a vegetarian or vegan diet, and it's fairly inexpensive. Most of us like beef. We like to have a steak every now and again. We like a burger. You know, we, we like a grilled chicken sandwich or something like that. So spend your money, invest your money in the protein side of this because it can either make or break you here more quickly than any other category, especially when your money's going the wrong direction here. So the, uh, the proteins that are good for you are the ones that are raised the way the animal was designed to be raised. Wild caught fish one of the best, healthiest foods on the planet. In fact, we see the Mediterranean diet is one of the best diets for heart disease and inflammation, mainly because of its focus on seafood. You're getting seafood once a day for the most part with the Mediterranean diet, plus a, a whole you know, plate full of vegetables to go with it for three meals a day. If you do that, you know, so long as you're avoiding allergens or food sensitivities, you're going to get healthier. Like it might not cure you of whatever you're dealing with, but you're going to get healthier doing it that way. And it's because 
the, when the animal is raised in the environment that God designed it to be raised in, it thrives the way that God designed it to thrive for the most part, so long as there's not any interventions into that system, any interferences happening in its system. So wild caught fish, very, very high in omega-3 fatty acids. It's also one of the few good sources of vitamin D that's naturally occurring that isn't sunshine. It's, it's incredible. You can actually get vitamin D from wild caught fish. You can't get it from farm-raised fish because the fats that the vitamin D is stored in have become denatured. And so then you look at something like fish oil, you also need that to be at a really high level. Beef on the same, on the same side of the fence, if it's you know, either like a, a wild buffalo or bison or you know, an antelope, or let's say it's a grass-fed, you know, grass-raised, grass-finished cow, it's going to have the right ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s in it, so it's not gonna create more inflammation. But a corn-fed cow or beef or whatever, bison, it's going to be denatured and it's going to have a ratio of about 17 to one omega-6s to omega-3s, where it needs to be somewhere between one to one and four to one. And so it's highly, highly inflammatory when you're doing that. Not only that, then we go to the fourth category, toxicity. You're not just what you eat, you're also what you eat, ate. And a lot of the corn-fed cows have some of the most heavily sprayed with pesticide foods. And so now you're eating corn-fed beef, or maybe you're even grass-fed, but not grass-finished beef. They finished it with corn and they give it the conventional corn to fatten it up, but you're getting those pesticides and those sit in the fat cells. And even though there's more omega-3s there because it was eating an omega-3 rich diet with the grasses, now it's also got a heavy dose of pesticides, which then hits you a lot harder than you just eating even the same corn your body would process out better, process out better because you wouldn't eat as much. So it's much higher, much more highly concentrated in those doses. And then the, the, four, the fifth category, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the hormones in beef, you know, when they add those to it, and they've, they've cut out a lot of it, you'll see like most, even milks will say, RBGH free, which is just one specific type of hormone that's gotten some fame. But yeah, when you add growth hormone to some of these chickens or some of these cows, that can really be disruptive to your endocrine system, which is a lot of, a lot of cancers are actually caused by that. And cancer, you know, really starts at that inflammation component. Yeah, antibiotics too. Also, you know, we, we take way too many antibiotics. I mean, if you, if you just look at antibiotics from a perspective of antibiotic resistant bacteria and how many more we're seeing, most, maybe not most, but a lot of the hospital deaths that we see, you know, with it being the third leading cause of death is hospital deaths are because of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And most of that isn't because humans take too much. It's actually because animals, the animals that we consume take too much. And these, um, uh, these infections become resistant to our antibiotics. And so that's, that becomes a major problem. But the last category, uh, before I forget, <laughs> jump into that, is actually your, um, your allergens and sensitivities. So you need to avoid your allergens and sensitivities because if you eat, like you, you can eat a perfect diet. Let's say you jumped on the Mediterranean diet and you're getting whole grains and you're gluten intolerant. You might have celiac, you might just have a sensitivity to gluten. But every time you eat that gluten, regardless of how much fish you're eating, regardless of how many vegetables you're eating, every time you eat that whole grain, it creates inflammation in your gut because of that crossing over between the blood and the food and trying to get the nutrients out of it. And the gluten hits you and you just respond to it negatively. So you need to identify those food sensitivities and those food allergies. And you can heal from those. In fact, uh, good news on that. Just this weekend, my daughter, we found some grains that she can eat that have gluten in them she is no longer as sensitive to them as she has been for the last five years. Same thing with my oldest son, nine years. He's, he's been basically intolerant of all dairy, whether it was lactose-free or not. And now we've started to find some cheeses that he can eat. And yeah, it's, it's really cool. We're starting to have breakthroughs after investing all this time and all this money into it. And now there's, there's like certain things that have gluten in them that they can eat. But where we're seeing the biggest project, problem is when you combine those foods. The processed, processed dairies, processed grains, they're actually the ones that still create the inflammation that makes them respond badly to it. And so we're, you can heal from sensitivities, but it's a long journey where you really have to be disciplined with what you're having and what you're not having. 
So what are anti-inflammatory foods? And you can actually see a really good example of those up here. Berries are a great example of that. That's a great place to start. Healthy fats are another great place to get anti-inflammatory foods. So we talked about what healthy fats are. There's a couple of examples there on the screen as well. Antioxidant-rich foods. So berries are an example of antioxidant-rich foods. Most dark colored vegetables or vibrant colored vegetables are very high in antioxidants. Most spices and herbs are very high in antioxidants. Most essential oils are very high in antioxidants. And then leafy greens, of course, very high in antioxidants, but high in a lot of really good micronutrients as well that help to deal with inflammation. So we kind of put all this together on the advanced plan and the, the basic premise of the advanced plan is those five categories that I went through. So number one, we got to curb our carbs. Try to aim for no more than 30 to 35 grams of sugar per day. If you can do that, you're gonna do great. And the best way to do that is eliminate all grains. If you eliminate all grains, all processed sugars, you will very easily do that. You'll be struggling to find carbs. <laughs> It'll basically be coming from fruits and vegetables at that point. Number two is gonna be fix your fats. We're gonna go from processed fats to naturally occurring fats, ideally in the foods that we're consuming, but they can be extracted in the case of things like avocado oil, olive oil, coconut oil. If you can tolerate dairy, then grass-fed butter um, is a great source. Whole milk can be a good source of that as well. But if you're getting those dairy products, that goes into the third category, perfect your proteins. We want to get grass-fed dairy and animal products. Grass-fed, grass-finished, wild-caught, pasture-raised. Those are your keywords that you're looking for. Category four is trash your toxins. We're looking at your, your proteins, right? We want to get organic proteins, or at least naturally raised in an environment that isn't heavily pesticide spray. We don't want to get farm-caught fish. We don't want to get you know, the, the chickens that are only in the hen house all the time, 24-7. We want to get the animals in nature the way that God designed them to be raised. And then lastly, we want to avoid those allergens. Identify them first. Identify those allergens and sensitivities. And you can do that with muscle testing or pulse testing very, very easily. Pulse testing is just getting a baseline pulse. And then after you count that out for 60 seconds, put the food in your mouth that you're curious about, whether you're sensitive to or not. Counting out 60 seconds of pulse again and if it goes up or down by five beats per minute from that baseline pulse, now you know you're having a stress reaction when you're eating that food. So you need to make sure that stress isn't coming from somewhere else. So like, don't have your spouse yelling at you while you're doing the pulse testing. <laughs> that would disrupt that. But that's a, that's a quick and cheap way to identify those food sensitivities. Don't <laughs> yeah, don't, don't look at your bills. Don't check your voicemails or your emails. Yep. What? With allergens, mm -hmm. you want to tell them about the I mean, we, we muscle test in the office all the time. And oftentimes we test out medications. And I can't, I can't say that you shouldn't take a medication, but I can tell you how your body responds to that medication with a muscle test or a pulse test. And oftentimes we identify things that somebody shouldn't be taking before they have the side effect because of that pulse testing or muscle testing. And I have a really good test no. in almost all vet clinics. They use petrochemicals mm. for preservatives. Yeah. Plus a lot of other medications. Yeah, it, pretty much everything you should muscle test for before taking to make yeah. sure you respond well to it. Yeah, we take a pound test just from yep. smoke from oh. cannabis. Yeah. We use this petrochemical in there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, somehow they got it in the trees, and when the trees burned, the chemicals in there got into the air as well. So, not good. So, the second cause of inflammation in the American lifestyle is our sedentary lifestyle. And you can go back to the early 1900s, and you can see this shift as well, because in the early 1900s, we didn't live the way we do now. Right now, over 90% of us live in the city. And back in the early 1900s, it was the other way. Over 90% of people lived and worked on a farm. And so you get up with the sun, you go to bed with the sun, sometimes before the sun, you know, in both cases, to be able to do the things that you need to do. And you'd be moving throughout the day. Maybe you'd sit down at the end of the day to rest from what you just did. You'd sit down at meals to rest from what you just did. But now it's the other way. When we go to work, we sit. 
And when we're at home, we, and maybe not you, you're on your feet all the time. But it depends on the job. But most of us, see, you know, the average American sits in an average of eight or more hours a day. And that can be at work, that can be at home. I know when I'm done at work, I, I'm on my feet all day too. I wanna go home and sit down and I'll end up sitting for a couple hours on it. I'm like, I know this is bad for me. We know that an hour of sitting is just as harmful to your overall health as smoking a cigarette is. More so actually. You look at the average life expectancy decrease for smoking a cigarette, it's about 11 minutes. Sitting for an hour takes off 12 and a half minutes. So what's considered rest, the best resting position is horizontal, right? Yeah, and the reason why that sitting is bad for you is actually because of the stress it puts on your central nervous system. The stress on the spine is highest in the seated position. Now you got a little bit of work to that, like you're bending over to pick something up. That's the most likely position for you to damage a disc and your low back is to bend from a seated position and lift something heavy from here up to here because it puts more of that rotational component when your spine is not prepared to actually handle a load. Spines are designed to hold a load from up here or down here, the squatting position, right? And so you don't wanna be lifting from, you know, even, even bending here is awful for you. But yeah, that standing position actually is half the amount of stress on your spine as the seated position and horizontal is half the amount as the standing position. So if you can lay down on your front or on your back to get that rest, to take the load off your feet, you're going to be much better off than when you're seated. Yes, ma'am. COVID and the positive breathing, mm -hmm. like the patient yeah. insurance the last day for life requirement. Oh, goodness. And you say that that was the worst thing. Yeah, the recliners are so awful. It's like, here, let's buy your coffin for you. Just lay in it to get it ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it pushes you forward in all the wrong spots and makes you fall back in all the other spots. So yeah, the sedentary lifestyle, and a major component of that is exercise too. We're not getting enough exercise. We're not moving around enough. Now, the best form of exercise is the one that you'll actually do. So I'm not here to vilify any exercise at all, but because really all exercise will reduce inflammation, and it does it by creating acute inflammation. Right? Because whenever you exercise, you create micro, micro tears in your muscles that require more blood flow. But as it does that, it actually pulls nutrients in, it pulls some of those free radicals out and pulls the carbon dioxide out and pulls some of the lactic acid out and it brings it outside of your body and you end up healing faster, not just from the micro tears in your muscles, but from all the other things that are creating inflammation in your body as well. And so the best way to do exercise is to do it. Second best way to exercise is to incorporate some interval training. And interval training has been shown, even better than cardiovascular exercise, to actually benefit the heart and benefit the metabolism and benefit anti-inflammatory components inside your body. And so all you have to do is you have to add in that small push and small rest. And you can do that anywhere from 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off, to a minute on and a minute off. And so when, when you've set aside your time to exercise, what you do, and if it's just a walk, you start with a slow walk, do it a slow walk, give it a 20 second moderate interval where you can feel yourself getting a little short of breath while you're doing it for 20 seconds. And then you go back to your slow walk for 20 seconds. And then you increase to that moderate interval for 20 seconds. And I know some of, some of the people that are watching right now might not have the capacity to even walk. And so I'm, I hope you have a soup can at home, maybe two. Two would be great because then you can have one in each hand and you take those and while you're sitting in that recliner that Medicare will pay for that you can die in, right? You just go back and forth, 20 seconds and then rest, 20 seconds and then rest, 20 seconds and then rest. Maybe bend over, 20 seconds and then rest. And maybe you can stand up and you can do a little 20 seconds of squatting a little bit and then rest. And if you can go deeper, even better, go all the way down. And you just incorporate that interval and you can watch TV the whole time you're doing it. You know, it doesn't even have to be hard, but if you're in the gym and you wanna do some running, you wanna train for a race, we know that interval training is one of the best ways to get you faster even over long distances. And so incorporating that is actually great for performance enhancing as well. The guy that broke um, the five minute mark for the mile time 
he was a medical resident at the time, didn't have time to run marathons, run miles at a time. And so he went out and on his lunch, he would sprint around the track so he could get his time up as quickly as he could. And maybe he'd only get one lap in, maybe he'd get two laps in, but by doing that, he was actually able to train himself to break that five minute mark. And since his record has been eclipsed, but they thought it was physically impossible for humans to break that mark until he started doing that. Next category is mindset stressors. And so some of our biggest ones here, social media. Social media, because we see everybody's best foot, right? They put their best foot, the one without the toenail fungus or any of the bruises or dents or bunions or anything. They put their best foot forward on social media. They show you their highlight reel, right? They show you their highlight reel. And then you take that and you look at that and you say, oh, good for you. Like, share, smile, whatever. And then you're like, but oh, man, when was the last time I had something like that? Man, they get to do that, man. And then you start getting down on yourself. And we see that the more people use social media, the more anxiety and depression that they experience throughout the day. It creates a stress response using social media. The next is the news, right? And you guys have heard me talk about the news before. Their job is to create stress in you. They want you to come back to try to get that update on that thing that's unresolved. They will make a mountain out of a molehill to get you to come back to create that anxiety and turn on your sympathetic response and draw the blood away from your internal organs and send it to your extremities and kick on those stress hormones so that they can make money off of advertising. <laughs> that's their main thing. It doesn't matter which news company you're talking about. That's their main job is to stress you out. Even if they're coming from your same political belief, the best thing to do is just turn it off. You're not going to get everybody to turn it off. And so you're not going to miss out on the important things, right? We'll find out when the election is, maybe a day or two after it happens. We'll find out who's president, maybe a week or two after it happens. Guess what? The world's not going to end. And when it does, we're all being happier for it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Fear is a major part of that. But then the next one here is actually negative relationship. Negative relationship. When you get in a place where there is fear and hatred and animosity and stress coming from just an interaction with the person, it's time to exit that relationship. And maybe it's just a break and maybe it's creating healthy boundaries. You have to, you have to protect yourself. All right? And so you have to make sure that you have healthy boundaries around each of those relationships and get, get toxic people out get toxic relationships out of your life and just surround yourself with healthy people. Um, Jim Rohn, uh, he was, uh, I have some of his videos running on the TV, old, old time, you know, uh, inspirational speaker. Yeah. He had just come in and teach people how to change their lives through, you know, basically the power of positivity, but also the discipline and the habits necessary to create success. And one of his biggest things was you are the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. And so if the people around you are just negative and create stress in your life, you become negative and stressful. They had a study that was done on neighborhoods and they found that neighborhoods, that even if you moved into it and you were happily married, love of your life, perfectly matched in every single category, if the people on your street were divorced, you would almost guarantee a divorce in your own relationship. Yeah. And I mean, it goes back to a time, too, when more people interacted in neighborhoods. Like, I don't see my neighbors very often anymore, but there used to be a time when those were the people you interacted with most. You'd go over to their house for dinner. You'd have them over. Now that doesn't happen so much, but it, it proves the point. When you surround yourself with a certain type of person, you become that certain type of person. And that goes the opposite way as well. You can build yourself up successfully. You can build yourself up into a positive, optimistic person by surrounding yourself with those people. You can build yourself into a healthier person by surrounding yourself with positive thinking, positive healing, healthy individuals. And that's one of the reasons why I love to do these classes is because we get to do that there. Yes. Rohn, R-O-H-N. Yep. Jim Rohn. Yep. Yeah, he really is. So peace management techniques. How do we create peace? Because 
Focusing on the stress is not going to get better. If we go back and we say, oh, social media is a problem, we are like, we go onto social media and we say, social media is a problem. We're going to create more stress by going into that and focusing on the same thing with the news. If all we focus on is how negative the news is and you don't want to hear about negative news all the time, you're going to get stressed out about the negative news. And if you focus on the negative relationships, you're going to create problems there. So what do we do to create pace? <clears throat> well, it has to be positive actions in the opposite direction, right? And so a social media fast, right? Taking a couple of days or one day a week or, or you know, go, go through a cleanse, like a, a technology cleanse. Um, I just got this book on forest bathing, going out into nature without any technology and just, you know, being in nature, even if it's just for a couple hours at a time. I mean, heck, even having a view of a tree outside your window compared to somebody who doesn't is going to improve your mental health right? Meditation and prayer have been shown to have huge health benefits, both mentally and physically. Deep breathing. You know, we, we talked a lot about um, uh, just the effects on the nitric oxide production of deep breathing through the nostrils. You get more nitric oxide produced in your body, which increases cardiovascular elasticity, allowing your blood pressure to normalize, your pulse pressure to normalize when you do deep breathing. And so it, it really comes down to you and what creates peace in your life and then focusing on that thing. And some surround yourself with positive people, surround yourself with people that pray, surround your people, yourself with people who are peaceful and calm and you'll do much better than if you focus on the other thing. Yes. Crossword puzzles. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. That's great. So next, toxic exposure. So we talked about trashing your toxins. Where are these toxins coming from? Well, these are the five rooms in your house that have the most toxins. So number one is going to be your laundry room. So what are some of the things that create toxicity in your laundry room? Detergent's probably the big one there because pretty much no matter how you do your laundry, you're adding detergent of some kind in there. And so uh, the Environmental Working Group has a healthy living app. Or you can go to ewg.com and just search for detergents, and they'll rate them on a scale of 1 to 10 with how toxic they are. You want it to zero, ideally. The, um, the ones that you find at Costco, not good ones. Not good ones at all. Mm-hmm. Oh, the dryer sheets? No. The laundry sheets. I, haven't, I don't know that I've seen those. But they will have them on EWG. So look those up and see how toxic they are. Most things aren't good. Most things aren't good. And it's been one of the hardest things for me to find are good detergents, and I have yet to find a good fabric softener. The best solution I've found for that are dryer balls. Um, and you drop a, a drop of essential oil in there. So you want it to smell like lavender, you drop a little lavender on there and you run it through your dryer with those. And it doesn't, it doesn't clog up your dryer with any of that waxy substance that comes off it either. So it's better for your dryer. So dryer sheets are another one that are actually really bad for you because they have PFOAs in them, which are you know, really, really bad for you from a cancer perspective. So we wanna avoid those. So laundry is really, really big. Next one is gonna be your bathroom for a lot of reasons here. Number one, you know, the cleaners and the soaps and the conditioners, and then even more so for you ladies, if you're using any makeups or beauty products, the beauty products have some of the most dangerous chemicals out there. There's still things like lead and arsenic and some of those, you know, lipsticks and, you know, I, I don't even know. Like, I, I just see some of the stats on what's still in the beauty products, what's allowed to be on the beauty products, and just know that about 30% of what gets on your skin gets into your bloodstream unfiltered by your digestive system. So it's you're, at that point, some of it's going directly to the organs and cells that are going to be impacted by it. Some of it's run through the liver, but ultimately you're getting more effect from what's on your skin sometimes than even what goes in your mouth. Next is gonna be your bedroom. In bedroom, what we're really coming down to with the bedroom is we're coming down to things like the clothes that you're putting on your body. Um, some of these uh, polyester, type clothes, you know, especially when they're new or your mattress, if it's brand new, they off gas. 
and some of the chemicals that are in there, they off gas and you breathe that in and it can affect your lungs just like putting stuff on your skin as well. And then oftentimes when we have a bedroom, um, we also have laundry there and that gets kind of stinky and we put those little plugins into the wall and those plugins, they have chemicals as well that can make you sick. So we wanna look out for that. So uh, candles as well, often sometimes are burnt in the bedroom. And if it's not made out of a natural like beeswax um, or soy candles sometimes can be a little bit better. Um, but most of the artificial ca candles, things like BB&B, those stores, they, they really put a lot of chemicals in those things. Kitchens can get really bad, not just because of the food and the additives that are in the food, uh, but because of the different cleaners that get on stuff, the cookware, that we prepare our food in. Um, so at this class I was teaching on Saturday, one of the gals, it was her second class with me, she came up to me after when she said, Dr. Jake, I just wanna let you know that because of you, I changed out all my cookware. I went and got all the green cookware, the ceramic nonstick, yeah. and that is much, much better than your, your standard, like, you know, aluminum nonstick pans or, um, you know, the, the worst one there, what, what is that one called? The um, What's that nonstick one called that everybody gets? Teflon. Teflon, since I started learning this stuff back in 2010, there's been statements by the EPA saying that they recommend that by next year, 2011, 2012, 2013, every single year they come up with this statement that it be removed from the market. That's not safe for human consumption. It needs to be removed from the market. And the EPA has no teeth to actually remove it from the market without other government agencies agreeing and coming in. And it's just too profitable to remove it from the market. The problem is you stick a canary next to your stove while you're cooking with Teflon, the canary dies from the off-gassing that happens from the Teflon. So we need to watch out for that. So are the copper? copper is better, but not as good as like the ceramic nonstick or the cast iron pan or the stainless steel. Those are the much better options. Copper is okay, but you have to watch out because if your copper levels get too high, it can also make you sick. Same is true of iron. You, you can get too high levels of iron. It's just harder to get too high of levels of iron because most of us are deficient. No, it is good. <laughs> yeah, we're just not designed to eat <laughs> the cast iron, right? So yeah, and then the last, last one here is the living room for a lot of the same reasons as we talked about with the bedroom. You know, oftentimes we're getting new furniture that has to off gas. We're putting, you know, those little plugins in the wall and then the perfumes that we put in the air as well can get really bad. So detoxification strategies can be as simple as simple lemon water. It can be very cleansing. Oh, the carpet too. It catches so much dirt. The cleaners that we use to clean either the carpet or the hardwood floors or to refinish the hardwood floors. There's so many different chemicals that are out there. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, Brit. Oh, all the time. So something as simple as lemon water can really help to boost your your detoxification systems inside your body. But the the biggest thing that you have to do with detox is you have to stop being exposed to the toxin in the first place. So if you're consistently being exposed to it, stop that first before you start investing in some of the other things. But then adding things like um, um, Foods that are rich in glutathione, like onions and garlic are, are really good. High sulfur foods are usually rich in glutathione. Um, getting N-acetylcysteine in because that is the precursor so your body can make the glutathione and you can process it as well. So um, most important thing with detoxification is just get it out. Get the toxin out first. Um, one of the big ones you mentioned was medication. That's another one in the bathroom. If you're on a medication, know there are side effects. If you're on two medications, know that you just amplified those side effects for both of them by taking both at the same time. And if you're on more than that, they can't, there's not even a supercomputer out there that can calculate the most possible side effects that happen when you take three medications simultaneously. And the sad part is that the average American takes 11 medications. And it's just astronomical the amount of damage that we're doing because of all of those medications. So stop it, get yourself healthy, remove those, remove those inflammatories. But then subluxation, our society just doesn't acknowledge. Like all the, all the other stuff you find research for, you know, out there everywhere, maybe some companies don't want you to fight it, but nobody talks about subluxation. 
And subluxation it really comes down to, is your nervous system functioning optimal? Is your brain talking to the organ cells and tissues so that when you twist your ankle, the right thing happens in your ankle? Because guess what? If you cut all the nerves in your leg that would go down to that ankle and you step off the curb and you twist the ankle, first of all, you couldn't step off the curb because now you don't have any control of the leg. But if you could, and the ankle was deprived of nerve supply, would it have any inflammation at all? It wouldn't. And you'd just go walking around, damaging that, that ankle over and over and over and over. Same thing is true with your gut. If you have no nerve supply to your gut and you keep eating foods that are inflammatory, your body won't respond with inflammation because it's the nervous system that controls it and tells it to start healing. And that's where that inflammation starts in the first place is to provide healing. And so you actually need that in order to heal. But the problem is that when that's interfered with, when the brain is interfered with, it can create just as big a problem in those organ cells and tissues as severing it would, right? Because what we find is that when, this, when the nervous system is perfectly protected by the spine physically, by the skeletal structure, so straight up and down from the front, three 45 degree curves from the side, that nervous system can't be interfered with, can't be damaged from a physical perspective. But you take that out of alignment, even two millimeters or two degrees, shift it forward, shift it to the side. And now that amount of change can disrupt the signals going through those nerves by as much as 60%. Now, let's say we're getting toxic chemicals building up in the thyroid. Don't have nerve supply because I've lost the curve in my neck because I spend too much time down on my cell phone. What's going to grow inside my thyroid? Not good cells, bad cells. Cancer has a much higher likelihood of growing in a low innervated area than it does in a high innervated area. You cut the nerves going to cancer, cancer spreads and grows astronomically. Same thing with the heart. If we have too much head forward posture, we see that two inches or more of head forward posture, ears to shoulder, doubles your risk of cardiovascular disease. If you increase your thoracic kyphosis by more than five degrees, it doubles your risk of cardiovascular event and it doubles your mortality risk compared to your peer group. So just standing up straight, neurologically, it expands your lifetime, expands your life experience, and expands your life quality as well. But more than that, it helps you heal from those little things that are keeping you from being able to experience life as you're supposed to. And so when, when people come to me and they say, Dr. J, can you help me with my irritable bowel syndrome? Your gut's inflamed. You've got leaky gut. You've got all this stuff going on. What's the first thing that I should do? Have you checked it for subluxation yet? Have you looked to see if there's a disconnect between the brain and the gut? Because if there is, it doesn't matter if we put you on the cleanse, walk you through the, the 5R system where we reset the entire gut and help it grow a new gut lining. If you don't have that proper nerve supply, even doing all that might not make a difference. You can spend tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to reset the gut. I had a patient just last week, come to me in tears saying, Dr. Jake, I am only here because you saved my life. And I have to acknowledge that I'm not the one that saves your life. I am not the one that does the healing. But what I did is I was the doctor that told her her Crohn's was not just a function of bad genes. That was just not something that she was afflicted with but it was a consequence of lifestyle. And the first thing that we had to address was the interference between her brain and her digestive system. And as we did that, and then we started to add in the other good things and remove those bad things as well, her Crohn's started to turn off. Her immune function started turning up. Her digestive function started to turn up. And now, even though she was anticipating being the first of her siblings to die and leaving everything to them, now she's having to find new people to pass her, her worldly possessions onto after she goes because her siblings aren't outliving her anymore. She is healthier than they are, even though they don't deal with Crohn's and they don't deal with IBS. It's just amazing what can happen when you address things from a cause perspective. So 
nervous system is first. You have to address the nervous system first. If you're asking, why am I dealing with X symptom? Have you addressed what the nervous system is doing? What is it doing? What did you spend all day doing? Were you on your feet all day? Were you sitting down all day? Were you bending over and picking stuff up all day? Like that may have added some stress to your spine and your nervous system, right? Were you looking at your phone all day? Were you sitting in front of a computer all day? Were you sitting in a truck all day? Those add stress to your nervous system. Next, it's the thing that resonated with you, right? Once we address that, it's what, what resonates with you. So your body heals on this time. You have to recognize this. All healing requires time. If you sprain your ankle and in the perfect environment, it gets everything it needs. It may be six to eight weeks before it's fully healed. Right? It's nothing happens overnight. It might feel like it sometimes, right? Some of you have had adjustments where it's like, oh shoot, that just fixed it. It's like, no, it's healing now. It's better now. It's it's doing what it's supposed to, but it doesn't happen overnight. We need to give it the time that it requires in order to heal. But the nervous system does control everything. So uh, you guys probably recognize these x-rays, but for those of you online that don't, these are x-rays of my dad. So when I first became a chiropractor, my dad uh, happened to show up to see his new grandson. <laughs> he wanted to meet grandbaby Dietrich. And um, that's the point at which I realized my dad was a very sick man. You know, one of, one of the best men I know, but he had basically worked himself to death, given himself congestive heart failure because of the stress, because of the toxic environment, because of the food he wasn't eating and the food he was eating, because of the lack of exercise in his life but mostly because of his spine. And I said, right, the two biggest areas for heart disease are head forward posture. And he had 2.1 inches of head forward posture, 53 millimeters, leading to 21 pounds of stress going across the nerves that go to his heart. And he had a hyperkyphosis of more than 10 degrees, right? And so his risk of dying that year was twice what people in his peer group were, which is not good for 59 year old males. It's not a good mortality rate. And so, I sit down with him and I go through everything. I said, first of all, dad, I can't want this for you. You have to be the one that wants to show up to Dietrich's kindergarten graduation in five years. You have to be the one that wants to live and thrive and be there to play with your great grandkids on the beach, you know, while they're wanting to play flag football or tag or whatever. You have to be the one that's motivated to get there. I can't do that for you. I can give you the steps. I can give you encouragement. I can coach you along, but you have to be the one that's motivated to get there. But the other thing I know is that you need professional help in fixing this, right? You can't just wish you had good posture and try to hold yourself up. It doesn't work that way. It requires a mix, fix, set process. Without that mix, fix, set, it just goes the other way. It's Wolf's Law. When a joint's out of position, it degenerates at a rate of 7% per year. So about 40 years from now, now you're in phase three, you're bone, bone on bone in those joints that were just simply stuck out of position 40 years before because you did nothing about it, because you didn't think a subluxation was a big deal. And so you have to have regular evaluations. You have to get regularly adjusted. You have to do regular home exercise. You have to do that warm up process. And then that set strengthening process after the adjustment or else it just doesn't happen. And so he did. For two years, he went to the chiropractor before we got these results. And the big thing here is we took about five degrees of that hyperkyphosis off. And we took about an inch of his head forward posture off. And in that time frame, he lost 80 pounds. He lost all the signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure. And he survived for the next 10 years and more because it's still going. And, you know, he, he took a little, little bit of a dip through COVID there. He and my mom struggled with long COVID for about a year. And they're just now starting to come out of that. You can see him on the upswing, finally. But I know that if that had hit him when he was 59, he wouldn't be here. Because of the actions he took and drawing that line in the sand and putting his feet down and saying, this is where I take my stand and this is where I take responsibility for my health. That's why he got healthy. That's why he survived COVID because he wouldn't have. And I'm grateful that he did. So if you're a guest, <laughs> this is what we do, right? If you're watching, you're brand new online. We do $49 new patient exam, x-rays, digital nerve scan, first adjustment, which I view as part of the examination process because I want to see how you respond. 
and your report of findings so I can give you your recommendations and you can see exactly what you need in order to heal and get well. For the rest of us, you have to decide what your next most important step is. Because I can't live all of your lives. I can't know exactly what you're doing. I can help coach you. Cheryl can help coach you. But really, you need to see, self-assess, right? Where am I lacking? And if you need some help in that assessment, we have the lifestyle risk questionnaire. And if you haven't taken that yet, ask me afterward. I'll give you the link. Um, text me at the office, 402-413-8825. I will send you the link directly. Fill out that form. It takes between 15 and 30 minutes. And then we'll get a printout of where you're doing the best and where you're struggling the most. And then we can help you develop a plan for how to take care of the most dangerous things so that they're not as dangerous and that we can start actively building health in your body. But if you know, based off of what I was just talking about, exactly what you need to do, that's where you start. And if you need help, ask for help. All right? So upcoming events. So your next action step is to keep plugging in, right? Because if we don't keep plugging in, we don't keep getting better. And so I, I love seeing the same faces at these workshops because it means that we're continuing to learn. We're continuing to apply. I learn something new every single time I do one of these. Maybe I ate too much ice cream last month and I forgot. Ah, that's, that much sugar is not good for me, Dr. Jake. Like, hey, come on, get it in there. You need to hear it over and over again. So two weeks from today, on August 28th at 6.15 p.m., we're going to be talking about sleep and how to get a good night's sleep and how to get the most rest out of your sleep and some of the things that will interfere with us getting good sleep and then some good habits and behaviors from that. And so, yes, I love seeing the same familiar faces continuing to learn. What I love more is new faces being introduced into the community in that healthy environment so that they can cover it. So if you know someone who's struggling with their sleep, whether they have sleep apnea or they're just not getting a good night's rest or they need some helpful tips or tricks to get there, this is going to be a great workshop for them. Cheryl's leading that one up. But that, again, is Monday the 28th at 6.15. Two months from now, in October, that is Cancer Awareness Month, right? It was Breast Cancer Awareness Month for so long, but now it's just Cancer Awareness Month. And cancer is the biggest killer worldwide. Heart disease is number one in the United States. Cancer is worldwide. And you look at it between breast cancer and heart disease, you're talking about two-thirds of all deaths. So if we, can, if we can really address those, and we know that cancer is 90% or more lifestyle preventable, if we can prevent that, most of this room survives to you know, wake up when Jesus calls us home, as opposed to when we kill ourselves through the bad habits that we're making. So start thinking about people that need to be there. We're going to make that a big event. Still need to plan it out as far as where we're going to have it, but if we get enough people signed up, we'll rent out a space to hold that size of people. So be looking for that. In the interim, we'll be looking at uh, next month is probably going to be a healthy aging class, making sure that everybody in our office has the key tips that the world's leading cultures um, have for living life to, to the maximum, but how they get up into the 80s, 90s, hundreds and still thrive and not just survive. So those are the upcoming classes. So, yes. Mm -hmm. I get so many different examples of what that can do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, really what I've seen with long COVID is that wherever you were struggling, whatever organ was the most inflamed when you got COVID, that's the one that struggled. And it's not just one usually. Usually it's all of them that were inflamed, but you notice the ones that were most inflamed. And those are the ones that tend to fail during COVID. And those are the ones that are most likely to kill you. But if you don't die from it, but you're also not healthy enough to recover from it quickly, now you're just dealing with even higher levels of inflammation in those same organs. And so you can almost reflectively go back and say, I don't know what was the most sick when I got COVID, but now I know what was the most sick because this is the symptom that I dealt with for the longest. For me, when I got COVID, I didn't get long COVID. I just got tired. It was just inflammation across everything. Everything needed to heal. It required so much of my energy. I was just physically exhausted. And so that spoke to my stress and my lack of sleep. So it wasn't an organ system in particular. It was just everything got hit all at once. And I didn't have the coughing, the sneezing, none of that. My wife 
she had all the hacking cough and, you know, it even got painful and her ribs and, you know, chest muscles got sore, which a little bit more classic sign of COVID. Um, my, my, my dad's uh, blood pressure got and stayed really high, like dangerously high. Like most people would be like, you, you need to go to the emergency room for how high it was. But he lived like that for over a year without having a cardiovascular event, thank God. But it was due to the increase in inflammation that having COVID puts on your body and not actually being, being able to cleanse out of that. So yeah, that was that was long answer. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. All right, let me turn this thing off and then take any more questions for you guys. <clears throat>